Welcome everyone to the talk, Testing Service Mesh Configs and Kubernetes Manifest by Srinivasan, Sekar and Ashit Thorat. Without further delay, over to you Srinivasan and Ashit. Thank you Gundan and welcome all. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, I don't know, <laughs> basically based on the location. Uh, so we are going to talk about testing the Kubernetes and Service Mesh Configurations. Right. We'll start with the introduction first. I'm Ashay Thorat. I work with ThoughtWorks as a lead consultant. Um, I have been with ThoughtWorks for five years, but developing softwares for more than, um, I would say, 10 years now. Um, Java developer, that's my uh, core skill, but I have been doing a lot of other stuff, for example, front end development, testing, um, DevOps tooling, and as well as DevOps consulting. DevOps consulting also. Yeah, that's about me. And as you can see, there are my uh, Twitter and GitHub handles. Uh, over to you, Srini. Thanks, Ashay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And myself, uh, Srinivasan Shekhar, an open source enthusiast, Appium member, contributor to various open source repositories, including Selenium and WebDriver.io, and I'm a conference speaker. I work also as a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks. And today we're going to talk about testing service mesh configurations and Kate's manifest. So agenda for day is, we are gonna talk about what Kubernetes is all about and how does the manifest of Kubernetes look like and some of the failure stories that happened in Kubernetes world and how you could ensure that we don't get trapped into those failure story and a short demo as well on that. And service mesh, what service mesh is all about, different services that we could uh, uh, get from service mesh and how does the configurations of service mesh actually looks like and also a short demo on uh, service mesh configuration testing right cool so before we get into what kubernetes is all about i'd like to start with an analogy where let's say i own a 10 bhk house having 10 rooms and i would like to rent three rooms out of it and let's say uh, th there are two options ideally i have one I can take care of uh, advertising. Uh, so I could uh, find tenants online through any online accommodation service, myself taking care of all of those responsibilities, or probably I could hire someone to do that for me, right? So let's say I, uh, it's basically, uh, you have to decide a rental, uh, probably hire a rental agent and uh, take care of all of those uh, uh, things that you ideally have to take care of, right? right? Uh, identifying the three rooms available for guests and then probably ensure there are proper bedding there and then probably take care of their, uh, probably take care of the keys and uh, make sure it's, the rooms are clean and other things, right? So there are two options, whether you do it, everything, um, I mean, you do it, everything, or probably hire an agent and they take care of it and how they do it, probably they might have their own employees, which could help you taking care of uh, uh, probably one takes care one of the employees takes care of uh, cleaning one of the employees take care of preparing food uh, another one might take care of uh, logging who has came in who has came out what time they came in and what kind of foods they have ordered and all of those things right so how does it relate to kubernetes exactly right so uh, the agent who takes care of all of those things is what kubernetes going to take care of everything uh, related to configurations I and mean, spinning up uh, proper, uh, I mean, you, when you wanted to deploy a service, right, you have to tell Kubernetes that uh, it's one of an orchestrator, container orchestrator. You have to tell it that how many number of pods you wanted to run and what's the resource that you wanted to allocate to the pod, right? So that's about, that's about what Kubernetes is all about, right? So uh, what, so you just say Kubernetes uh, containerized application and you just say uh, Kubernetes that I have to run five replicas and each with two CPUs and three gigs of RAM and it takes care of orchestrating everything. So similar to Kubernetes, there are a lot of container orchestrators available and we are gonna focus only on Kubernetes today. It helps us to orchestrate the containerized application and by spinning up the number of parts that you want and allocate certain resources that you have asked it to do so. So how you could do it, how you could instruct Kubernetes to do that, right? You have something called a manifest file. So Kubernetes workloads are actually described in this YAML manifest, and there are a lot of kinds of manifest files, and we have two different manifest files here. One is a deployment manifest, another one is a service manifest. And we have a sample of those manifests here. 
in deployment manifest you uh, probably tell that this is the container i mean this is the image and this is where it exactly resides in in the container registry and then this is the port that i wanted to assign to that container port and in terms of service manifest we just say i mean we say the name of the service and you assign certain metal i mean uh, you certain uh, probably assign some labels to that service and uh, you assign port numbers that i mean port number that it has to bind to in terms of tag and also the protocol in terms of communication so on a high level this is how the kubernetes manifest exactly looks like right so that are, when we define this as an infra consultant or a developer or qa who defines this can uh, uh, probably there are high chances that we could do certain mistakes when we are defining kubernetes uh, uh, manifest to give you an example let's say we have in provided the tougher target port for your service so you might not be able to see the service available for us to use or if you say uh, there are chances that you might end up uh, in, i mean you might end up uh, creating some security loopholes probably let's say you have uh, deployed a kubernetes manifest in your development environment enabling privileged access and then pushed it the same configurations to production enabling the privileged access for the container so it introduces a security loophole for you right so there are high chances that a lot of things can go wrong when it comes to kubernetes manifest and there are tons of failure stories available in market to there is even a website to list down what all uh, failure stories that different organizations have gone through right so if you understood their failures and you will uh, if you never know their failures you will never know what successes that it could bring in and how you could avoid those kind of failures right? so uh, to give uh, to give another uh, example probably quite recently facebook went up uh, for almost more than 6 hours and uh, the configuration that took it us there so probably they would have tested everything and they might have not tested probably they tried to test everything in deploy i mean in production just because of a configuration change you might have huge business impact it might take off your brand value as well in matter of few seconds it's not just that application code resides in production it goes along with its own configuration so as like how we give importance for testing your application code the business logics in it uh, it's also uh, i mean we have to give equal importance in testing the configurations that sits along with application code as well right so only if you make sure that these two coexist and works together very fine then you could ensure that things goes well in production too. and there are a lot of failure stories which i would like to uh, defer it for now but there are a lot of wonderful stories as well in terms of how kubernetes solve problems for different organizations too so as you being working on kubernetes for quite some time so what are the some uh, what are some of the failure stories that you encountered or some of the best practices you make sure that to, you don't get trapped into those failure stories can you list out some that you have uh, uh, thank you shrini i think probably the failures are pretty common i think you mentioned some of them right configuration errors and i think most of the developers who are using kubernetes might have been in that position where you make some mistake and then you realize it when you deploy it right it's quite late uh, to that's still quite late feedback basically but there yeah, i think as i was saying and, the, and many of the people who are using kubernetes have experienced a lot of smart people have come up with best practices right so the kind of there's a list of best practices you need to follow when you are working with kubernetes and if you are a developer who has access to kubernetes manifest yeah these are the practices you must know and try to follow them so to list some some of the few i think the first one i would like to talk about is health checks now basically what is health check it tells if your service is healthy is it able to serve any more requests or not in kubernetes world there are two probes liveness probe and readiness probe and you can use those to decide if your service is able to take any more requests or not and then kubernetes can orchestrate based on the status so you must have this thing con configured in your service when you are deploying another one being graceful shutdown i would say uh, so we use containers in kubernetes right and they are throwable throw away disposable so it is pretty common that you basically discard them at your will right you deploy a new version you just throw away the older version you change some configuration you throw the older version and redeploy something so when you throw it away you need to ensure that it has enough time to process what is working what the particular instance is working on imagine it has taken a service a request on a 
HTTP and it is processing it. It's not good practice to kill it abruptly. Maybe you take some time, give it 30 seconds, a grace period, and then probably you can clean it up. Kubernetes allows that out of the box and you should try to use it. Other one being uh, fault tolerance. When you're using microservices, you will have a lot of moving places, moving, moving pieces. And imagine one piece going kaput and taking down the whole of your system, right? It's not a good experience. You It may cost you money. It may cost you reputation for your organization. So it is important that we build it for fault tolerance. And the easiest example I would say is uh, the replicas, right? You can have more number of replicas. Kubernetes allows you to specify that in the manifest. You say, I need to run three replicas so that even if one of them goes down, the other two are there to uh, back it up, right? And Next one, I think the most important one, I think in all of that is resource utilization. Now, what is resource utilization? Every service you run, these are the containers and they would need processor and memory. If you don't put any limits, any bad container would try to hog all the resources and then other processes, other services on that particular machine will starve, right? It can bring down your node. It can, have, it can lead to outages. So it is very important that you put a limit on what can be consumed by a particular service. And that's basically about resource utilization. Kubernetes allows you to do that and you must specify that that is one of the good practices. So the list is long. Maybe Shini would like to talk about another few. Sure, uh, Ashe, yeah. So uh, there are a lot of best practices that you could ensure when it comes to Kubernetes well. Uh, Ashe has listed a few. If we uh, go over it and probably we can talk about resource tagging, right? So uh, resource tagging is ideally uh, you tag your pod with some labels associated to it, right? So you tag it uh, basically uh, probably with some technical labels or probably some security labels or probably some business labels associated. It could help you identify in manifest. If you just go over the manifest, it could help you identify what this is actually about. Let's say if you wanted to say the name of the application, uh, you could tag it there with some labels associated. Or probably in business world, you could have certain labels in terms of uh, uh, making sure who is the owner of this actual application, user to identify who is responsible for this kind of, I mean, for this application or what project it belongs to or business unit it belongs to, right? So you can actually tag your labels to make sure that it is actually helpful in terms of providing even in the security context, it helps us to provide, I mean, you can tag in terms of confidentiality or you could ideally tag it as well as in terms of what kind of compliance that it kind of uh, adhere to like certain specific compliance requirements, right? So in terms of configurations and secrets and Kubernetes world, it is ideal to actually uh, segregate the configurations from the application itself and keep it separate. So application can focus on business logic and configurations can be externalized and you could define what kind of resources you want and all of those which I mean, uh, in terms of configurations. If you, and the main benefit that you get is you don't have to recompile your code when you wanted to change configuration, which means even when your application is in production and that means it's wrapped and running in production, you could change the configurations dynamically. So that's another advantage. So you don't have to redeploy it. Uh, probably same code can be used in multiple different environments, right? So uh, those are the things. Whereas configurations alone can change in terms of that, right? Cool. So, um, and in terms of secrets, it is uh, a best practice to mount secrets as volumes, not as environment variables in Kubernetes world. The contents of the secret resources actually has to be mounted into containers as values rather than passing it in certain environment variables and exposing it, right? Exposing it. So this will prevent secret values appears in the command that we use to start the container and so on. So, so in terms of part security policy, the part security policy will help you to restrict whether the container should run in privileged access or not. Probably it is a best practice to not run your container as a root user and give them appropriate uh, access, uh, give them a pro disabling the container privileged access or using only, uh, uh, probably limiting the capabilities to uh, uh, preventing privilege escalation. So likewise, there are, these are con uh, fraud related security policies. In terms of namespaces, you can uh, actually define limits in terms of namespaces. So these are some of the, 
some of the best practices that we actually captured here then there are a few more and there are a lot more and but the ideal scenario is how do we make sure these best practices are actually ensured over a period of time right so let's say i am playing around with my manifest file and then i just uh, accidentally moved it to production without validating it right so it could take up your complete business value out of it even though the application tend to work fine in local and end to end probably everything right so a simple configuration change can mess up everything so you need to have appropriate checks around these best practices when you uh, when i say you need to have appropriate tests around this uh, kubernetes manifest so one of that probably to start with is basically you can ensure whether it, the yaml structure is proper whether the yaml is actually uh, described well and it's proper or not and another way is probably to capture certain policies some of the policies probably if i if i could give an example one of the policy could be i don't want my run container to run with privileged access i don't want to pull secrets uh, i mean i don't want to uh, keep environment variables as secrets i can probably mount always as volumes that's one of the policy likewise you could define your own policies and make sure that these are actually tested even before you go to production so after going to production and figuring out something probably it takes its own cost right so the feedback cycle is also huge so there are a lot of things that you could ensure even before you deploy this configuration so introduce introducing a static checks um, i mean against the deployment manifest that you have created with certain policies will help you uh, uncover a lot of errors even early in the development cycle and there are a lot of ways to do it some of the categorizations here is like api validators built in checkers custom validators uh, maybe asher will take us through uh, how api validators is actually different from built in checkers and how you could write configurations uh, policies around certain configurations thank you shini i think before we move on to the validators let's look at this deployment uh, manifest so shini showed us the one before but this is for the another application nginx front end application it is on the port 80 and it's basically trying to serve the static contents maybe right if you look at this yaml file there is one error here it looks correct structurally but if you look at the replicas uh, here we need number not the number name but we for example by mistake i just wanted to show you some validation so we put some um, wrong thing over here which is the number name right now if i have this deployment yaml manifest how can i ver verify it with api validators maybe we can move on to the next slide shimi so there are couple of tools uh, the one being coop eval uh, this one basically so before that i think let me introduce how it works in kubernetes you have your kubectl command that's a client and then there is a kubernetes server how do they communicate using the uh, rest api right and when it's a rest api you can have a open api specification you can have schemas so kub eval has list of all the schemas for uh, some of the recent versions starting from version 1.10 to latest version you can have different it already has the different version schemas with it and when you want to verify a yaml file you can verify it against a particular version instead of uh, verifying against a fixed version you can choose which version you want to verify your yaml against and as you can see for the previous file it shows you the error as expected it wanted the spec dot replicas to have a integer value but it got the string so it is able to communicate the problem right it's one way of uh, verifying it against the schema other one is actually inbuilt in kubectl command so if you have used kubernetes you would know this kubernetes cli have a apply command which allows you to deploy your workload using the apply command but it also has a flag dry run what i'm telling here is you try to process this yaml but do the dry run don't really deploy it and in this process it also can also it in this process also it can tell us the problems in this particular manifest as you can see highlighted the error we expected that it expected the integer but got the string then how they are different right to be well do not really need a cluster you just need this particular tool you do not have to connect to the cluster and it can you can test it against different versions whereas kubectl command needs to have connectivity to a certain cluster and whatever resources you want to verify those will be verified against this fixed version which is running on the server so this is these are just two of 
the many available for the api validators but yeah just wanted to share some of them uh, if you want to explore you can obviously explore and find out more let's talk about the built in checkers afterwards so there are other tools who have some built in open ended checks when i say open ended checks there are some policies or some best practices which that particular tool believes in so for example one of such tool is kub score if you run it you can say kub score score and the yaml file which you want to get a score for if you look at the sample output uh, it is pointing out four critical uh, things we should take care of one is about network policy two uh, for the security context and the last one is about the image pool policy in the interest of time let's focus on the last one if you see here uh, it is saying that image pool pool policy should be set to always and if you are not setting it it will give us the error why do they say that imagine you have a latest tag and you keep on pushing to the same tag when you say image pool policy is always even if the latest tag is present on your machine you will always try to repool that image right this ensures that you always get the latest one obviously looks good but then it's not the case which datadog failed datadog uh, the leader in the um, observability they have publicly mentioned one issue where they used to have image pool policy as always that actually when they got their cluster down their cluster tried to pull so many images from registry that registry thought it's a ddos attack and blocked them right so one pit one size will not fit all right so uh, how do you solve this problem then if there is open ended tool you might your team might have a different opinion how do you solve it i think that's where uh, some of the other ones comes into picture which is the custom validators the tool let's look at the screenshot this is the rego language uh, and the tool we are talking about is contest which is able to run the policy checks what you see in this screenshot is we are saying if i have a input of kind deployment the yaml file is of kind deployment i want to get all the containers and for each container i'll check if line is probe is defined and if it is not defined i'll deny i'll deny this policy i'll deny because of this policy so that's how this particular test runs okay contest as a tool do not really only work on the kubernetes it can work on any structured data your terraform files your um, docker file also or even a response from any api or json file it can even check that so it's a general purpose uh, structural checking tool um, i think maybe let's try to understand more about contest a uh, quick time check i think we are almost 20 minutes right uh, so let's talk about how contest works behind the scene it is based or it is built on top of something called as open policy agent open policy agent as you can see in the diagram is a decision it's a policy decision engine basically and it allows you to decouple all your policy related stuff to a, to this particular engine you can delegate all this uh, policy policy enforcement to this engine how can you do that and how it is general purpose and unified tool let's look at the diagram if you look at the bottom of it there is a policy file and then the, there is a jsa a json data what i'm saying when i have this data and i have the policy list opa can check for us if the data conforms to the policy which is defined if not it will tell us the output at the same time at the top if you see there is a service so it is pretty common that you have authorization in the microservices for example role based access control right so you can also define those kind of rules in opa and then your service can talk to opa to ask if these are the conditions should i go ahead or not by the policy so your service is not worrying about the policy now it's opa who is making all the decision you can offload it you can manage it separately for all the policy related stuff that's how it is a unified tool which actually works across the different uh, tools across the cloud stack yeah that's about policy agent maybe we can move on to the next screen and over to you for showing it to us how it works So let's take a quick demo on how does this uh, policies are actually defined and how we could ensure these policies are actually uh, being adhered in the uh, deployment yaml right so i have a deployment yaml here so it's quite simple and what we are defining here is we have a container and this is the image where i need to pull this data uh, image from and the container port is assigned here and we also have a security context to ensure that we are not running it as a root user so i'm saying here run as a non root user and i don't provide any privileged access by default so if you have to build policies around this deployment yaml right so uh, the, uh, ideally you could say 
always run uh, with non root user as true don't run your container as a root user uh, probably don't provide privilege access to containers maybe when it is running and if you look at the image probably you can also say uh, the container registry that it has to exactly pull that from probably you might have container your own container registry and you wanted to pull the image exactly from your own container registry or probably you can say uh, i don't want to pull images which with uh, which is with the tag latest or probably i wanted to have certain versions instead of having it as the latest so you have certain policies you could define certain policies and make sure that these policies are actually being tested against this deployment yaml to ensure that even before you goes to production and then figuring i mean goes to deployment and then figuring out things in the environment rather you could do that upfront and ensure that we are adhered to that certain policies so as i said some of the policies the way how we have written in return it in regu you could see it here wherein you say uh, let's uh, say input of kind deployment and uh, i'm going to get all the container images so I just travels through this path and figures out the container is an array and get all the image names out of it. That's what I do here in line number five and make sure that if, uh, I mean, I, I just checks whether the image has a tag called latest, right? So if I found this tag, probably I would say that uh, deny such, I mean, deny such deployments to go forward. So images should not be ideally tagged as latest and uh, probably if, it, if it, you define that as a policy, we should adhere to this upfront, right? Uh, I mean, we should check this upfront. And another policy is about, again, checking whether the kind is of type deployment, as, I, as we have seen previously, right? Uh, there are two different types of manifest we had. One is kind deployment kind, and another one is service kind. We have other kinds of manifests as well. So we wanted to apply these policies only if the kind, uh, the manifest is of kind deployment. And we are saying that if, uh, I mean, again, Travis into the path, and we are saying that the privileged access is ideally, if it is true, then deny such uh, deployments to happen. So it's not about Kubernetes. I mean, it's not about conf test. It's not about repo. You could ideally define this in any tool, but have your own opinionated checks and make sure that it's actually bubbled within the team and ensure everyone is following the standard. So this will help you to define certain standards as policies and ensure that these policies are actually adhered. There are chances that you could change it to latest at times and then try to deploy it, or probably you might have, or you might be running it in privileged access and try to move that to production. Again, you will uh, introduce a security loop for that, right? So likewise, you could also have uh, policies around your volume modes. Uh, which volume, uh, how does I need to mount a volume? Or probably let's say minimum amount of resources I need to spend for this container. That could also go in as one of the policies. So now that we have certain policies, let's see how we could run these policies using confess. So we have seen confess, just print it in JSON format as output, and this is where my policies exist, and this is the manifest file that I wanted to run it across. So if you see this, we're saying that there is one successful and another policy that run for a task because the image is tagged with latest. So I go back and figure out, okay, image is actually tagged with latest. Let's see if I could suffer. I mean, I will make sure the policies are working fine, right? So like define your own policies, your own opinionated checks and make sure those policies are actually accurate. A minor mistake, even in the resource from capital G to small g on uh, lower case and case conventions can even go into a huge disaster when it comes to uh, resource allocations as well in terms of Kubernetes well. So now that we have seen everything on Kubernetes well, let's talk about what service mesh is and service mesh is all about, right? So service mesh, uh, it's kind of a low latency layer on infrastructure and enables service to service communication. If we go back to our analogy, I had three rooms. I mean, I wanted to rent it and I did take an option to go ahead with Kubernetes. I mean, that go ahead with agency to manage all of my requirements, right? So rather than I taking care of orchestrating, someone takes care of orchestrating. Let's say I am going there with the, let's say now there are multiple agency who wants to take care of individual services. Let's say one agency takes care of uh, cleaning, another agency takes care of uh, 
probably preparing food. They don't know each other, and there could be employees within their agency. They have to talk to other agencies and ensure that they are providing proper service to our tenants, right? So they need to know each other's identity to enable communication. If they don't know the identity, it is difficult for them to communicate, and there might be employees uh, around the clock going uh, going ahead and coming out, right? And we need to also have a gateway when we are assigning certain competencies to certain. We also have to have a gateway and ensure there are security protocols managed and security is actually uh, a built-in citizen there, right? So how do we ensure that? That's when so service mesh comes in picture. It externalizes all the communication between services. Let's say if you're taking a, an e-commerce world wherein uh, you are doing a payment, and the payment service ideally has to talk to another availability service to ensure that the product is available during payment, right? So there needs to be some communication always happen between microservices that are deployed in Kubernetes form. So one service has to understand how does the uh, communication happens. I mean, how does communication can happen between uh, so, uh, the services that are deployed in other kind other parts in Kubernetes world, well, right? So how do we ensure that? That's when service mesh comes in picture. It helps us to externalize that's configurations from the service. So service can still talk about or uh, ensures the business logic. The configuration related to communication is externalized. Let's say I've tried to speak to another service, but there were, due to low latency or due to certain issues, it failed. I have to retry it. So rather than be building the logic inside the service, how about someone takes care of retry logic, right? So service can focus on business logic. Externalizing those configurations will help. Probably someone can feed those configurations runtime against every service pods during a runtime, injects those configurations, and that works out of work. So now service knows. Uh, so uh, so now service knows knows how can I talk to service. So. If that's been done during, uh, I mean, that's been taken care of automatically, I can focus on business logic and I could put only those business logic, right? So service mesh on as a whole takes care of this. So service mesh ensures fast, reliable, secure communication between microservices. And it also provides a lot of other features as well. So service mesh is kind of a paradigm and wherein there are multiple implementations around it. One of the implementation that we are going to talk about today is Istio. And uh, paradigm is common and implementation is something that we have picked up and we are going to talk about Istio's architecture now. Cool. Thank you, Shini. Maybe I can try to walk us through the Istio architecture. As Shini said, it's a paradigm, right? I think even the architecture for most of these uh, service mesh would be almost similar. So you would have a control plane and then you would have a data plane. Control plane controls the data plane. Okay. As a developer or as a DevOps engineer, you would instruct, you would send your instructions to STOD at the bottom. You can see in the architecture, you would send it to control plane. And then control plane will ensure that all the configurations or instructions, whatever you have provided, translating them to the understandable format for other components and then propagating it across the cluster. That is the responsibility of control plane. I think the Core logic over here is how does it does how how does it the data how does the data plane manages all this uh, stuff you were talking about right? It's pretty simple basically. If you look at the uh, high upper part of the diagram, there is a service and every service has a proxy. Okay, this is NY proxy. The logo you see is of NY, and this NY proxies are the only entry and exit point, ingress and egress basically for the given service. Okay. So what you do, your service do not really care about how I talk to external world or how external world talk to me. It just cares about the business logic. And these NY proxies will have all this responsibility of communication, enforcement, metrics. So all these cross-cutting concerns can be basically managed by proxy. How? Now, going back to the same analogy which Shini introduced, right? Imagine for each room, you have a person sitting on the door, okay? Each time someone goes in, that person will control who goes in. Someone wants to go out, that person can control who goes out. And when you are able to track that, you are able to also able to count how many people went in, how many people came out. You got the metrics, right? When someone is coming in, you can ask them from where you came. When someone is going out, you can ask them where you're going. That way you got the tracing. That is another cross-cutting concern. 
at the same time the person can maintain the register for all the people coming in going out you got the logging right so this way all this cross cutting concerns along with the network traffic and routing can be managed here also imagine a person wants to visit another place and he asks the person uh, there is someone in the room he wants to go out and he asks how do i reach service b and the person tells okay if you have any message give it to me i'll pass it on that's how that process takes offloads the routing part also right so that's the architecture at high level maybe we can i think into the next topic so there are multiple things you can achieve one of the pretty common use case which you can achieve with uh, service mesh like istio at really less efforts is canary deployment but let's try to understand what are canary deployments first suppose you have a website it's uh, pretty famous right everyone likes it but then there are some features you want to add you worked on them now you have pretty much more features you feel it would add a lot of value to your service or your website but if you just say that i'll bring down the version 1 i'll deploy the version 2 and imagine there is a bug there is some problem your website will go down right that's a risk so to mitigate that risk what you could do is you can do canary deployments what it means is you slowly route the traffic when you introduce a new version you only send some percent of the traffic over here get the feedback look at the logs everything looks okay start increasing the percentage and eventually v2 will start serve all the traffic and you will shut down the v1 that's how the canary deployment works maybe let's look at the sample uh, configuration how you do it in istio this is just if you look at this yaml configuration by the way it looks almost similar to the kubernetes structure and they do follow similar structure actually here the kind is virtual service and what i'm saying is in this virtual service if you look at the destination i'm saying i want to route traffic to hello world and if it is subset v1 send some traffic over there if it is v2 send some traffic over there by the way do you see some error over here right if you look at the weights that is the percentage if i say send 90% to both of them that means in total it is 130% of traffic which is wrong you would have only 100% so there is something wrong over here and this is one example of how what can go wrong in your configuration you would realize it it is wrong when you deploy but is there a way to get early feedback yes again the same tool set we can use to get the early feedback maybe shini you can walk us through sure. so If we pick the same service splitters, so we see that. So how we could define policies around this service splitter, right? So one of the policy could be that host name has to be same for both the versions, right? So that's quite simple. And probably weightage has to be uh, probably hundred, and it shouldn't be above that, right? And what? And also the versions has to be different. It doesn't make sense to give same versions and then. Route ten percent here, ten percent, I mean ninety percent there, right? So these are some best practice policies. Probably you might have tested uh, how does your application works, how does uh, version one works, version two works in a different environment post deployment. But there are some things that you could still take care of it even before you deploy, right? So these are some policies that we have defined. Probably let's quickly go through those policies. so one of that is a virtual service let's say i am defining the first policy where in the kind is of type virtual service and i define i mean i get the current host and canary host and ensures that they are same if it is not same then i deny them right and next policy is about again i'm checking whether it's a kind virtual service and get extra i mean i extract the weights from routes uh, i mean destination routes and assign it to current and canary and ensures that it is not actually greater than 100 if it is greater than 100 i also deny those, uh, those deployments right so how we could ensure this i mean how we could make sure that these policies are actually being adhered in the splitters.yaml so if you look at this one of that is successful because the host names were quite same and the another failure here is the service splitters can be actually greater than 100 which is not possible right so how what does it uh, how we could ensure that instead of uh, 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 i mean you can define your own customized policy checks uh, there are you, you can define policies even for service discoveries how can a service being discovered for example let's say uh, uh, service a has to talk in this way to, i mean service a identifies it in service b and then how does it needs to talk to all of those can be defined as policies and make sure these policies are actually tested against service splitters or service discovery arms and uh, is used right so this is a way that you could help ensure that even before you deploy something to production 
And uh, I mean, even before you deploy something to production, you could ensure that most of these uh, small, small NICs can be verified upfront rather than uh, deploying it and then waiting for the service to be uh, uh, receiving request. And then uh, there's something that you tend to change often, right? Do you play around with configurations in service splitter? One time you might go with 50 requests and probably 50, 50, uh, and then 10 to 90, all of those bit, right? So this helps us to, this kind of policies helps us to make sure that uh, the deployment YAML or the service splitter YAML or be it any templatized configurations in your application. So it's not that you send only application code to production, right? We send it along with its own configuration. For example, in terms of service splitter, we might have to ensure in, uh, we might have to ensure that the logics are actually fine against the service. I mean, in visual versions as well, right? That you will do it in probably post deployment or probably in a, another life cycle of uh, test, right? Probably here we are just ensuring that the certain policies are so opinionated checks that we have actually defined and we are ensuring that, right? So is that enough? Is that enough for us to say that Kubernetes will go uh, and work fine in production? Testing, we will never do enough of it. There could be bugs. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to reduce the impact. We wanted to base for it upfront and make sure that we get early feedbacks by testing templatized configurations in your application. Even if you take the same service splitter example, uh, making sure 90, 10 percentage, 90 percent to V1, 10 percentage to V2, is that enough? Maybe not. You might also have to ensure that the database that both the services use probably is compatible enough for serving needs of V1, serving needs of V2. That you would probably do it in different phases of cycle, but you might also ensure that both these versions come from same host. It doesn't make sense to test V1 from host one, V2 from host two, right? So how we could ensure those kind of things we don't mess up, right? So those are the ways, I mean, those are the ways that you could ensure the templatized configuration testing. Uh, static checks, building static checks, or opinionated checks, or policies, defining policies around it, and making sure there is a secure policy as code or infra policy as code that you are well defined and testing it against your application. Yeah, that's the intent, and, and that's us. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Shini. There is one question. Maybe we can try to answer that. Sure. Maybe I'll take a look at it. So I think there was first one about what are the other options? Like Istio is pretty much Kubernetes only. Uh, so what 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 else can you use? So yeah, HashiCorp console is something we have ourselves tried, me and Shini together tried to deploy it on virtual machine. And we wanted to connect Istio, uh, so, sorry, the service mesh on Kubernetes connecting to service mesh on virtual machines. So we were able to do that. And yeah, HashiCorp console support it. And I think the follow-up question is, yeah, from a feature perspective, would console have all the features of service mesh that an ISTO does? I think it's a paradigm, right? I think most of them have the single set of features, but the way they offer it, the way you can configure it, the way you can look at it, change it, I think that differs. That's the differentiating factor. And they will have their own um, unique features also. For example, ISTO is Kubernetes only, but HashiCorp console can run across different uh, platforms. So that is one additional benefit it offers. So there are differences, but on a, on a larger side, I think they offer same set of features, I would say. If you can able to achieve something, canary deployment with is two, you can very well do it with the console also or Linkerd also. That was an insightful talk. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us and listening to us, uh, giving us an opportunity to uh, present ourselves.